The corporation as we know it is in a crisis. It's big, it's slow, and not to forget, it's bureaucratic. Perfect for a world back then when no one had ever heard about COVID. But I think it's fair to say that with the loss of comedy parties and coffee breaks and all those perks, a lot of people are asking, what's the benefit of staying loyal? I mean, a new job is no further away than that link. And with no culture around, there's not a lot of loyalty left. In fact, I think it's time to ask the ultimate question, has the concept of corporations died? You'll find out right now. Hey everyone, welcome to all our viewers across the world and our World Business Forum audience and all our Chief Executive Magazine readers. I'm Martin Lindstrom, your co-host, along with my dear friend and the world's number one leadership coach, Marshall Goldsmith. Marshall is a member of the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame and has written some of the most iconic books out there, like What Got You Here Won't Get You There and Mojo, How to Get It. But besides that, I have to say, Marshall, I'm just impressed by how you can keep up with me on this show without killing me halfway through. So thank you for being a dear friend of me and thanks once again for joining the m and show. Uh, I am here with my wonderful friend, Martin Lindstrom, the world's expert on brandy. Martin Lindstrom, author of The Ministry of Common Sense, which I love that, also of biology and lots and lots of other great books. Time Magazine said, one of the 50 most influential people in the world. Yeah, look at that, 50 most influential people in the world. On the other hand, I've heard he's entered into the, the galactic competition against the tough competitors from Mars and other places. But in this world, he's right there at the top. Martin is also one of the world's most interesting human beings. So if you ever get a chance to learn anything about Martin, learn it. He is one of the most interesting humans I've ever met in my life. And a good guy. I have to say that I was so much hoping you wouldn't say that because the guests we have on the show today are so much more interesting than me, okay? Anyway, everyone out there, if you have any questions or comments, just post them here or tell us who you are and where you are. And if you, by the way, like this show, don't forget to press the like, the follow, or the subscribe button. Now, I have to tell you one thing. I will never forget when I stepped into an office on the 31st floor belonging to one of the largest bank in the world. The bank had asked me to introduce common sense. So I made an appointment with a member of the compliance team. Go figure, right? So here's what happened. So you must have produced a lot of rules out there. I said to this lady sitting there, kind of half jokingly, right? Where she said, and, and, and this was very interesting. She said, yeah, I have. And she handed my <laughs> a phone book size manual. And she was right. The book was packed with rule from A to D. The six other manuals were, by the way, waiting for me on the shelf. So while I was running this interview, I flicked through the book, right? And I stopped at a rule. And here's the rule. Digital signatures are not valid. Always ensure that the client sends a fax of the signed contract. I said, a fax? Isn't that a bit dated? And she said, yeah, but that's not my problem. So why don't you just throw out this rule? I said, well, why should I? She said, I'm paid to create rules. I'm not paid to destroy my own work. Brief in, brief out, Marshall. I guess I've seen my fair share of corporations, but I can think of one person which has for sure beaten both Marshall and I. And he's joining us now. He started in the U.S. Navy, was later listed among the 100 most influential people in Silicon Valley. Then he wrote the book, In Search of Excellence, the most widely held library book in the United States from 1989 to 2006. And one of the top three business books of the century, according to Wall Street Journal. He's one of today's most influential management thinkers in 2013 he joined the thinkers 50 hall of fame and this year yet another book i think it's book number 19 or something arrived from our guest excellence now extreme humanism let's 
play the drum rolls, please, everyone, for our guest. Tom, welcome. The iconic Tom, welcome. You could have kept going with that introduction for another five or ten minutes, but no, <laughs> honest to God, I'm overwhelmed by what you said. I seriously am. I'm just an old former engineer who really only understands a little bit of what our next guest understands. Well, I can tell you, thing, Tom, you disguise it very well then, if that's the case. I have to ask you a question. What is extreme humanism? Well, first, before doing what I'm supposed to do, uh, I'm going to go back to your manual thing. Uh, 515 pages. What was the length of it? The fat books. So when Mr. Clinton became president, Al Gore, his vice president, started something that actually worked remarkably well. And it was called Rego or Reinventing Government. And it didn't focus on problems. It focused on the lots of people who actually did things well. At any rate, the parallel to what you said is Bob started out with a manual that was 700 pages long, and he called in his number two, and I am speaking God's truth to you, called in his number two and said, I want this reduced to the size of a postcard, which is utterly, completely, and unbelievably insane. But he pulled it off. Uh, I guess I've been thinking about extreme humanism, though I didn't know it for a long time. But in a funny way, I just figured it out. I have a problem of reading everything I can get my hands on. And I read about this fascinating study. Uh, a bunch of radiologists are, you know, the tech who takes your shot is not doing anything. The radiologist who might be anywhere is the person who's making the important interpretations. At any rate, uh, a bunch of uh, radiologists were asked to review some large number of screens. Uh, but the catch was that each screen had a little square picture of the person who had been photographed. So after the fact, they go through it, and what term they use is what they're really looking for is anomalies, the things that don't quite work that might tip us off on something extraordinary. The same group of radiologists got the same film about 60 days later, and the number of anomalies that they found dropped by 80%, and the amount of time that they spent on each study almost doubled. I mean, there's extreme humanism, and it does two things that I like to say. It talk, talks about extreme humanism, and it says, you know, I've, I've been on this wicket forever. It's, it's the little stuff. Uh, it's the tiny stuff that mounts up consistently and so on. So I'm a... I'm a little stuff freak. Don't ever talk to me. If you ever use a big word around me like disruption, I will either throw up or walk off the stage. Uh, so that's number one. Number two in my answer is there was a day that changed my entire life. And I didn't know it at the time. When Bob Winter and my co-author and I were working on In Search of Excellence one morning, we drove down from the San Francisco office 30 miles to Palo Alto and visited a, a upstart not all that big company down there called Hewlett Packard. Uh, we walked in the door. We said we wanted to speak to John Young, the president. We expected, of course, because we worked in the Bank of America Tower, that we would get the executive assistant to the executive assistant to the executive assistant. But instead, we got John Young, who just walked out and said, what can I do for you guys? So he's going through his little ritual. And he comes up to the four letters which changed my life, M, B, W, A, managing by wandering around. And why do I say they were the most important words? You know, 
I was a McKinsey guy. I, I lived on charts and graphs and abstractions. And MBWA defined intimacy. And, and, and I know I didn't figure it out the next morning, but literally, it. I don't know what the hell my definition of management was before I, you know, before that happened. But whatever it was, it flipped about 179.5 degrees, uh, and, and that was a game changer for me. And it's something that an amazing number of people who read the book uh, actually remember as well. Um, just a couple of more things. There's a general by the name of three-star Army General Long Retired. He spoke to a group of senior Army officers at uh, some mid-level officers group together or convention. And these words came out of his mind. The one piece of advice which will contribute to making you a better leader, will provide you with greater happiness, and will advance your career more than any one thing can do. And that is, you must care. Just those three words. I mean, I just have a habit, maybe it comes from those Navy days of liking to uh, use inappropriate language. And my definition of you must care, which is actually in my book, is give a shit ism. And that's what it's all about. It's about people first. You know, it, it, I use in, in my speeches this little crappy slide of a tombstone, and it says Thomas J. Peters da, 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 to October da, 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 net worth the day he died seventeen million eight hundred thirty-two thousand six hundred thirty-one dollars and eleven cents. Tombstones don't say that. They say what kind of a human being was it? And, you know, and, and translating that in to day-to-day -day management is what it's about. I, I, was, I said management is the most extreme opportunity to change the world. And that sounds like total bullshit. But the reality is that when you are working with your six people or 6,600, you can change an enormous number of lives, an enormous number of those lives dramatically, which is way beyond anything that the world's greatest surgeon can do. You know, Tom, uh, I went to a program at the National Academy of Human Resources and the speakers before me were just talking. So I randomly had to sit there and they talked about employee engagement and they just, they said, what, what are the keys to employee engagement? They talk about empowerment and training, all this stuff, right? Then they said, global employee engagement is all time low. Well, since I went to that, I think it's gotten lower. A lot of people seem to know the theory, but for some reason, it doesn't seem to be working. Uh, what's going wrong? The last one that you want me to focus on. Rover. Yeah, what's going wrong in terms of employee oh, engagement? Going what's going wrong? Yeah. Some guy wrote a book whose name I can't remember, and he said the single most important thing that a leader does is hiring. You know, I know we'll hear a lot more about empathy and the like today, but if you want empathy, hire for it. There's a CEO of a biotech company called uh, Biogen, I think, and he says we only hire nice people. He said I got a slot for some sexy scientific thing and he said you wouldn't even know the understand the title of the job slot doesn't matter after he finished the candidate finishes with me he's got to talk to a random group of people who are really randomly assigned and they can be from the finance department they can be from housekeeping they can be from r d and if they don't pass the nice scale they aren't hired and i believe that is possible for virtually every single job in the world. If you want a bunch of people who care, I think there are a million things you can do, as we'll hear from some of my colleagues, uh, but it's nice to get off to a damned high start. And the other thing associated with that, which gets far too little attention, is the number one 
asset in any sizable organization is the complete cadre of first line leaders. Every variable that you can find is driven by that. And again, I know we say it's important and I gotta fill that slot. You know, leave the damn slot open for 18 months if you have to, as, as awkward as it'll be. But you know, we, we just don't, don't want any people in the slot who just don't do the people first or whatever you want to call it thing. And, and that doesn't make it easier, but you're really off to one hell of a good start if you pick the right people and if you promote the right ones among the right group to that first level. First level management, you can keep all your goddamn ISIT assets you want The set of first line managers will drive more profitability, quality, customer satisfaction, cleanliness in the restroom. I don't know what the hell what else. Martin, we got some great people Amazing here. Amazing stuff. Yeah, well, listen, um, I actually think we should just do a little bit of a introduction. Coming up right now is um, a fascinating person. Our next case argues that avoiding stress is impossible. But what can we do to adjust our relationship with stress? It doesn't have to own us. We can own it. How? Well, you'll find out right now, Marshall. Well, coming up, we have Susan David, Dr. Susan David, PhD, award-winning psychologist at Harvard, winner of the Thinker's 50 Breakthrough Idea. She wrote a spectacular book called An Emotional Agility, which is award-winning. She's given a TED Talk with 8 million views. And I think even Tom Peters is a big fan of this person. So Susan is an amazing person. She's going to talk about one of the most important topics today. And that topic is called Emotional Agility. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be with you today. And such important questions that we're asking about how our organizations are or unfit for purpose and also how we can connect better with people. I think the question that you ask about engagement is so profound and so important. And, you know, one thing that I'll just uh, add to the beautiful answer that Tom gave is um, I think what a lot of organizations uh, forget is that engagement is not something that gets written into a job description. You know, engagement is something that cannot be mandated. And so every time I hear of organizations saying, uh, uh, we've got this strategy, we've got these goals, these are the things we're trying to do, there's one word that comes to mind, and it's a four-letter word, and the word is risk. And the risk is that your entire strategy is dependent on something that cannot be mandated. It is people's to give not the organizations to demand. And um, this is where emotional skills have been segmented out of businesses. They've been seen as soft skills. And yet the skills of how to help cultivate things like meaning and purpose, feelings of autonomy and competence, these are the essence of what make organizations thrive. And uh, yet our traditional corporations um, Unfortunately, through history and through seeing emotions as these soft skills have actually undermined our capacity to really deliver on the kind of outcomes that are really important to the millions and millions and millions of people in our organizations. So thank you for having you know, me. And I'm glad to be here. Now, you know, you know, Susan, in spite of all of our wonderful work and the things that people have known right now, loneliness, anxiety, stress off the charts. Give people just a couple of ideas about the importance of dealing with stress and the tolls of not dealing with it. So I think it's so profoundly important, you know, even prior to this pandemic, the World Health Organization in 2019 uh, declared that depression was the single leading cause of disability globally, outstripping cancer, outstripping heart disease. And there is no organization, there is no demographic that is protected from this. And so in many ways, you know, COVID has shone a spotlight on issues like stress and loneliness and burnout. Um, but in truth, these ideas and this crisis 
has long been a part of what we are seeing growing across the world and also in our organizations. And I think that, um, Marshall, in order for me to really give a response about stress that feels whole and that feels human, according to what we're describing, uh, one thing that I just want to say first is that we know that the kinds of skills that I'm going to talk about, these emotional agility skills, are crucial to well-being. We know that they are essential to effective leadership and the ability to love and lead and work and be effective human beings. That said, uh, we cannot promote ideas of resilience that basically perpetuate the idea that people need to keep on adapting to untenable circumstances. In other words, what I am describing here when I talk about some of these strategies needs to be recognized in the context of they are essential and foundational to our well-being, and yet so are effective policies, systems, and processes in our organizations. We cannot simply ask people to keep adapting to untenable circumstances. So that said, let me give you some ideas that we know from emotional agility from my work that are really powerful. Um, for people who might be saying, well, what is emotional agility? I'll say that emotional agility at its core, I can go into more evidence and I can become really nerdy about this, but at its core, emotional agility is about being healthy human beings the skills that allow us to be healthy with ourselves and others. And uh, you can hear from my accent that I am originally South African. I grew up as a white child in the suburbs of apartheid South Africa. And this was a country and a community committed to not seeing, you know, to denial, because it is denial that makes 50 years of racist legislation possible, while people convince themselves that they are doing nothing wrong. And from a very early age, I became interested and profoundly kind of touched through a range of circumstances by the idea of seeing versus not seeing, denial versus not. And so emotional agility at its core is about this ability to uh, see ourselves effectively. In South Africa, there's this beautiful phrase that you hear every day on the streets, which is the Zulu word for hello. And it's sawabona. And there's this beautiful, powerful intention behind the word because sawabona literally translated means I see you. And by seeing you, I bring you into being. And so let me give you some practical, just very quick strategies that might be helpful to people who, like so many of us, are feeling exhausted and stressed and burnt out. The first is that I facetiously sometimes say that we are in a tyranny of positivity. And just to be clear, I'm not anti-positivity. I'm a pretty happy person. Um, but when leaders, when organizations endorse this idea that people need to be falsely positive, you know, people are concerned about a change, concerned about a strategy burnt out, and a leader telegraphs, oh, we've just got to get on with it, or you're either on the bus or you're off the bus. What that leader is doing is basically saying, you've got to be positive. If, you, if you're negative or if you bring your human emotions to the workplace, um, we're going to sideline you or we're going to see you as being someone who isn't on the bus. And so the first thing that I want to say is that there is a tyranny in our organizations and in our society of toxic positivity. The idea that even in a pandemic, we've got to perfect our screenplay or bake sourdough bread, and that if you didn't do those things, that you lack discipline. So the first thing that I will say to everyone listening is that this moment has invited so much of all of us. And if you are feeling exhausted or lonely or stressed or down, these feelings are normal. We are in the shadow of illness and death. So acceptance, the acknowledgement of what is the turning towards the self rather than denial 
is a prerequisite to healthy humans and to effective leadership. Another quick strategy, I've got so many, but I don't want to take up too much time, is that one of the things that we know is that very often when people are feeling stressed, what do they say? They say, I'm stressed. You know, I feel stressed. How was your day? My day was stressful. What's going on today? It's stressful. I would invite you for a moment to recognize that there is a world of difference between stress and disappointment, stress and exhaustion, stress and that gnawing, knowing feeling of I'm in the wrong job or the wrong career. When we label everything as stress, our body psychologically doesn't actually know what to do with it. So a really powerful strategy when you're feeling stressed is to recognize that your emotions are actually data. Your emotions are signaling things that are important to you. And you can't really read the data unless you actually go beyond this word, which is stress. And you say to yourself, what is actually happening for me? So we know that when people are more able to say, I'm disappointed, I feel unsupported, I feel bored, what that granular labeling is doing, it's called emotion granularity. What that granularity is doing is two things. Number one, it's helping you to understand in actuality what is going on for you. And this activates what's called our readiness potential as human beings, the part of us that allows us to take active steps towards the thing that needs to be addressed. The second thing that happens is we recognize that these emotions as data help us to understand what's important to us. When you say, I'm bored, that boredom is actually signaling that growth and learning are important to you. When you are concerned, that concern might be signaling that quality and, and connection are important to you. So our emotions are data. They're not directives, but they're data. And we need to go beyond just saying, oh, I'm stressed and really trying to understand how we can be whole and seen human beings in the context of that stress. Fascinating stuff. Very good. Amazing, Very good. Susan. Yeah. I love it. Oh, okay. Coming up, the next guest, surprise guest we have on the show, actually have an interesting statement about the cooperation. Our guest argues that if leaders spend more than half of their time on numbers and operational challenges, they miss the boat. So what should they spend their time on instead? Do you know what, Marshall? I think it's time to bring out our surprise guest, which I know you have a really special relationship with. Look, our next guest, I think, is the greatest leader in the world in the past 30 years. An amazing human being who I just love. Um, totally biased is Alan Mulally. Alan was the CEO of Ford Motor Company. He was the head of Boeing Commercial Aircraft. When he was at Ford, the stock went from $1.01 to $18.40, 1,837% approval. Even more important, almost 100% approval rating from employees in a union company. Alan, aside from being one of the greatest leaders in the history of the world, and, and when you're, he was ranked number three greatest leader behind the Pope and Angela Merkel only in the whole world, Aside from being a great leader, just one of the greatest human beings I've ever met. And I think Alan may have some questions for our guests. Alan, uh, I'm going to love to hear from Alan. He might have some questions for our wonderful guests. And now for the BCG well, let's minute. Let's run the BCG minute. <laughs> oh, very good. So uh, hello, Marshall, and hello, Martin, and uh, hello, Tom, and hello, Susan. It's an absolute pleasure to uh, join you on this important conversation. So I think the comments, the questions and the comments that have been made so far are really, really important because they're focusing on uh, going forward. How do we all uh, create organizations and cultures and corporations that enable talented people to work together uh, to create value for the greater good for all of us uh, worldwide. And so uh, my question, my first question uh, for Tom and for uh, for Susan is, uh, 
where the, from all and you've all been tremendous students for your entire life on leadership uh, and the impact and the importance of leadership in creating these uh, these cultures that are they're not only smart but they're also they're safe and they're healthy to enable people to bring their very best to the to, to achieve the goals and the objectives uh, and the visions of the companies. So my first question to you is, what is, in your opinion, and what you've learned in the past and also going forward now, what's the most important role, contribution, um, uh, and responsibility of the leader of the future to create these environments and this culture that now enables talented people to work together to create value for the greater good? Okay, Tom. I think I, 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 a hasty answer to that extraordinary question would be downright silly. I think we need to look, and again, sorry, because I'm repeating myself. I go back to hiring and I go back to first line promotion. We need people, you know when people care and when they don't. It's, you know, Susan said one thing about we don't take the soft variable seriously. I said my whole life is six words. Hard is soft, soft is hard. The hard, so-called hard stuff, spreadsheets, et cetera, are completely, completely malleable and changeable. The real hard stuff is the relationship, development of people, and so on. So look for it, for God's sakes. You can find it if you care about it. For every damn job, even in a company as big as the ones that Alan was running. Uh, that's first up. Now, Susan, what's your reaction? Yeah, so I, I would add to that, you know, there is a reason that emotional agility skills have been named by the world economic forum as the skills of the future. When we look at what cannot be automated, what cannot be partialed out, and the skills that are at the essence of adaptability and complexity, they are the skills like um, empathy. They are skills like compassion. Uh, they are being able to recognize this human uh, reality, which is that sometimes when you're trying to be inclusive, um, that's a beautiful, wonderful intention. But what is it that stops people from being inclusive? It's not their intention. It's that when they go into a meeting, their emotions, they feel undermined, they feel shut down, they're struggling to bring their values forward. And so what closes the gap between intention and reality in organizations, what connects with complexity and what is not able to be automated are emotional skills, these emotional agility skills. They are learnable. They are learnable at scale. They are often seen as difficult to, um, to teach. Um, but what I would suggest is that if you look at the history of that view that they are difficult, that history has a very long and checkered history. And if you if you will bear with me just for a minute, I'd love to explore it because I think it's really important. What we are seeing in our current organizations uh, in traditional views of corporations is an intersection of two paradigms that are devastating to human beings. The first paradigm is an... Uh, throwback to the industrial revolution, the idea that humans are somehow machine-like, that you can tell people what to believe and it'll come out the other end and everything will be fine, that we can rule by strategy and by logic. And it only takes a moment to recognize that people, people with hearts, with souls in organizations are still being called assets and capital and resources. And we start seeing this impact of the industrial revolution on our very language in organizations. The other thing that I would say to this is that the second paradigm is the paradigm 
that is the unfortunate feminization of emotions. What do I mean by that? If you look historically, what we see is that education was open to males. And what was taught in education was logic and sciences and mathematics. And the other stuff, the emotional stuff, was um, somehow aligned with being feminine. Now, what does this mean? What this means is that in organizations, we have this term, which is soft skills. And the term is really often one that sees emotions as being you know, the sideline at the periphery. It allows ineffective leaders to be sheltered because those leaders are good at the logic. Um, and the consequences are devastating to our organizations and to our people. You know, we see mental health as being at the periphery. Uh, we shelter, as I've said, ineffective leaders. And mm. for our organizations that are trying to evoke innovation and creativity and collaboration, there is no innovation that happens without potential failure. There is no inclusion that happens without potential discomfort. And so a very long answer to a very important question is that emotional skills are the most foundational skills to effective organizations, leaders, culture, engagement, everything that we are talking about today. Susan, I no, love Alan, what you're I saying here. I, I just want to you know, go back to you, Alan. I remember you have a very special set of KPIs, which really is building on what we're talking about here. And I also remember, I'm not sure if it was on the record or off the record, your story, but I remember you had a, you have a special way of measuring you know, the KPIs where teamwork is one of them and also a situation where one of your key folks at one of the companies actually were not matching it and how you actually made consequences around that. Can you elaborate a little bit more around my cryptic question here? Uh, sure, uh, sure. And, and also I would like to just um, uh, ask another question to Susan to build on uh, her, her wonderful comments about the character and skills of the, of the leader of the future to create these safe, uh, healthy, and, and smart organizations. And Susan, that is, um, so going forward, how do you see leader humility, love, and service and the importance of those three in our leaders of the future? Well, I want to hear about your KPIs, but I'll, I'll just say very briefly that they are foundational. They are foundational and they are foundational both for healthy organizations in which mental health and well-being and humanity and relationship and doing good and meaning and purpose and all of these things are recognized as they should be, as being central to the purpose of so many organizations. Um, but they're not only essential for what leaders do, they are also essential for the leaders themselves. It's very difficult to be compassionate with other people if you can't be compassionate towards yourself. Um, exactly. It's very difficult. Exactly. You know, it's very difficult to be a healthy, um, to, to see another person if you can't see yourself. And so these are whole people foundational skills. Absolutely. I I sure agree with you, and I'm. It's so, it's so reassuring and so insightful to have uh, your lifelong commitment to understanding these things and feel that way. I think it's most one of the most important things that's going to come out of this meeting. Okay, back to Martin's question. So, um, when it comes to performance measures and leadership, uh, what we've always used is a set of principles and practices and attributes that we all agree to. Uh, in our organization, whether it's on all the airplane programs or being the CEO of Boeing or CEO of Ford. And those um, those principles and practices and attributes included uh, both the process of working together and also the expected behaviors of all the participants. And the most, and to answer uh, Martin's question, the most important uh, contribution of the leader and the leadership team 
and to Susan's point, to hold themselves and their team and all the stakeholders responsible and accountable for following that process of working together, including those expected behaviors. So the question Marshall is asking is that, what do you do when you've helped everybody understand the principles and practices and the behaviors and people decide maybe they don't want to treat people with respect. Maybe they don't want to appreciate each other. Maybe they don't want to help people uh, and all the stakeholders grow over time. And so in the business plan review that we had every week, uh, all the participants are there. They're all hooked up all around the world. And we go through the entire business plan, the vision, the strategy, the plan, the areas need special attention, color coded, what, how they're going. And then creating this environment that people feel safe uh, and they can share what the issues are. They're not problems now, but they are gems that we all can work together. Well, every once in a while over the years, one of the members of the leadership team would go after somebody in a business plan review. And they either thought they were smarter than everybody else or, or they wanted to make a point or that's just the way uh, they had grown up with their leadership style of attacking people. And so I would follow them up or back to their office and, and I'd share with them our, our agreed to principles and practices of how we're going to treat each other and share with them that and ask them, do you think that you're, uh, you're following our agreed to behaviors? And just giving you one example, one of the leaders said, well, you know, I, I know that I didn't follow that today. And, and I really don't know, Alan, whether I can, I, I've been promoted. I've uh, been very successful. I lead with a little bit of fear and intimidation and top down uh, control and management. And, and I don't know whether, whether I can change that. And I understand the reason why we need the hearts and minds of everybody, but I don't know whether I can change. And my answer always was, um, well, I understand and, and it's okay. And they would look at me and I could tell by the look on their face that they, what they were thinking was, oh, I'm so important to this organization that I can continue with these behaviors that are not consistent with what we have agreed to is needed to create uh, safe and efficient and high performing organizations. And so they, he said, so, that's great, so I'll get an exception. And I said, well, you know, not quite. Um, I think what I mean by okay is that you are deciding to uh, move forward and leave. And uh, we're gonna be happier, the team's gonna be happier, you're gonna be happier. And so uh, what I want you to think about though is you do have a choice. And so I want you to think about tonight, tell me in the morning, would you like to move forward uh, towards these behaviors and following the process of working together. And if so, we'll get you uh, a coach. We'll use Marshall Stakeholder Center coaching and uh, the team will get behind you and we'll help you move forward. But if you can't, if you don't wanna do that or you don't think you can, then just let me know and we wish you the very best. And oh, by the way, our first principle and practice uh, and attribute of the leadership is we love you. It's all about people first. We love you and we'll continue to love you. And we, we're gonna wish you the very best. And nearly, I'd say 80% of the time, you guys, that when I, when I held that conversation with the people that choose not to participate, that 80% of the time they chose to move out of the swamp, away from Grendel's mother, away from Grendel's extended family, and choose to move forward to start to treat people the way we're all talking about here today. And that is could be the most respectful, the most important thing that we as leaders can do is to hold ourselves accountable, like Susan said, for these behaviors as well as following the process of, of working together. You know, Helen, I want to go to a point that comment, right? Marshall. I want to go to a point that Tom made about the self skills being tough and you know, Tom, my area is trying to help people change behavior. So I got a clue how hard this is. I have somebody call me on the phone every day because, you know, my name is Marshall. I'm too cowardly and undisciplined to do most of this stuff by myself. I need help. The thing I'm, that I love about Alan is Alan realizes how hard this stuff is. He works week after week after week. It's not some pep talk or pep rally. Just, just 
quickly, Alan, if you can give us an idea of what you do every week to make sure this happens, not give one speech at the beginning of the year and then let it coast. Well, that's a really important part of, of our, our working together over the 45 years of Boeing and Ford. And that is every week we'd have what we call a business plan review. And we usually start at, at 6.30 or 7 uh, uh, Pacific time to catch all the time zones around the world. Because uh, when you're developing a new airplane program, you have over 500, 600,000 people working on the design around the world. So working together is really, really, really important. And so I'd start out the business plan review and, and review that our compelling vision and the strategy and the plan for achieving that vision and the expected behaviors and the process of working together. And then every member of the team, uh, and we included everybody, engineering, manufacturing, procurement, legal, everybody's on the team, would go through their contribution to the overall plan uh, of what we're trying to uh, accomplish and the areas that need special attention. And uh, so you can imagine that the end of an hour and 15 minutes or so, we all knew everything about the plan, the status against the plan and the areas that need uh, special attention. And then we'd actually, to Marshall's uh, point, we included all of the stakeholders, not just the employees, but the suppliers, the customers, the, uh, the investors, uh, the communities in which we operate around the world. So they're all represented on the team. So everybody knows where we are, everybody knows how we're doing, and we all can then move forward to turn the reds to yellows uh, to greens. And so you can imagine how quickly the team comes together, includes all the diversity, is including everybody, and is holding themselves accountable for operating this way and enjoying the journey of creating something very special and take an airplane like a 777 that's going to take people safely and efficiently around the world to get them together so we can find out that we have more in common around the world than we're different. We can actually choose to work together for the greater good. So it's so compelling and it's so satisfying to be able to make contributions at this level. And the environment is what enables that to happen. And the leadership is absolutely uh, key to establishing that environment. And as Susan said, it starts with each of us, each of us. I know. Okay, Martin. It's, yeah, well, Martin, listen, I, I, I can only say I'm, I'm so impressed by your work and actually all of you guys and girls. But I have to say we are so running out of time right now. So I'm going to hand over the baton to you, Marshall, just to summarize this crazy conversation. How the heck will you summarize this? Well, like you, Martin, I'm so honored just to be here. And these are three people who are heroes in my book, in your book, and so very, very honored. And I would say the summary of this goes back to a point Tom made. It's all about caring and it's all about love and a point that Susan made. And it's all about doing the hard work required to make sure that that culture permeates your organization. So it's not a buzzword. It's not a theory. It's your day to day to day to day life. So very honored to be here with three totally iconic and amazing human beings. Amazing. Well, there. Well said. Listen, I want to say thank you to you, Susan. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Alan, for, for spending the time with us. And I'm going to try to do a little bit of a summary here. Let's bring up this mule summary for a second. And I did say try, okay, because this is not straightforward. But one of the things I picked up from Susan was that she said, engagement is not written into the job description, but in principle, it should be. I picked up this amazing statement from Tom Wood says, what is going to be written on your thumbstone is not that you earn $17 million. No one will remember you for it. You need to have that into your mindset. Also, Tom pointed out the whole idea about management wandering around, that whole idea about being present. I think a lot of leaders, particularly because we sit behind the screen right now, are completely forgetting it. And that brings me over to uh, Alan, which is talking about showing the way, showing consequences of not being human in the organization. That's where Alan said, listen, no, it's okay. And then basically they have to move on to another place. But let me just put a couple of graphic points on the screen because one of the things I liked was what Suzanne said. She said, she had a little model here. She talked about show up. And I'm going to bring up my little pad here and put number one in here. Show up. She said, face your emotions. 
what's happening during COVID-19 is that we have an emotional roller coaster going on. You need to face your emotions. It's okay for you to have those emotions. And by the way, everyone else almost have the same emotions. So face up to the emotion. The second point will be step out. Step out is make sure that you get rid of those habits which are cleansing on to the past and where in reality is not adding a lot of value. Third point I will bring in, walk your why. And that means identify your core values, which is back to what Alan said. Alan talked about how the core values is driving Boeing and Ford. Well, that's exactly what we're bringing out here. And then point four, move on, set goals and make tiny tweaks. No, don't change the whole world in one day. That's one of the things I've learned when we work with leaders around the world. Have small, I call it 90-day interventions, but small changes which can make a big difference once you have the fulfillment when people are basically saying to you, wow, you really changed. I guess that's the mule summary. Oh, I tell you one thing, Marshall, these summaries are getting more and more complex. I'm almost a nervous breakdown moment <laughs> right now. But I have to say to all of you out there, you probably were wondering, we have four men and one woman. That's a no-go. So the 28th of September, we will be joined by Sophie Scott, an extraordinary neuroscience and Professor Margaret Heffman. Uh, with three performances at TED. You basically will see that she's a fixed stable at TED. Take a look at this video. Evolutionary biologist at Purdue University named William Muir studied chickens. He was interested in productivity. I think it's something that concerns all of us. But it's easy to measure in chickens because you just count the eggs. He wanted to know what could make his chickens more productive, so he devised a beautiful experiment. Chickens live in groups, so first of all, he selected just an average flock, and he let it alone for six generations. But then he created a second group of the individually most productive chickens. You could call them super chickens. And he put them together in a super flock, and each generation he selected only the most productive for breeding. After six generations had passed, what did he find? Well, the first group, the average group, was doing just fine. They were all plump and fully feathered, and egg production had increased dramatically. What about the second group? Well, all but three were dead. They'd pecked the rest to death. <laughs> Chickens is on the agenda the 28th of September. Marshall, thank you so much. We'll see all of you guys same time, same place. Bye for now. always creates work, always. But it's very difficult to predict what those new jobs will be. Every single job in your company will change. That means everybody needs to be either upskilled to do their job better or reskilled to do a completely different job.